um, everybody, including professors of history, say, I, I, I never knew that. And why do you think that is? Why do you think that nobody, really nobody, almost nobody, has ever heard about any of this? The press had not covered it. The press. The not. press doesn't cover it, never covered it. All of that information about what happened after World War II um, was suppressed right. for more than 50 years. MacArthur. General MacArthur didn't allow reporters to know what was going on. In fact, they told him just the opposite of what was going on. And these photographs and film that I have and the documents have been classified documents and secret and have only come to light in about the last 10 years. So even historians and people doing research um, didn't have this information available to them. My undergraduate degree was in United States history. All I knew about Korea was there was a war. Um, we divided the country at the 38th parallel. And Sigmund Rhee was imposed as the leader of the country, a dictator. And what my father had said to me, he was in World War II and, you know, he was, General MacArthur was one of the greatest generals we ever had and that damn Harry Truman fired him and he should have let him go all the way to the Yalu River and push those Chinese out and we'd control the whole area, we wouldn't have, that's all I knew. Harry Truman stopped back the kick back. Yes, yeah. yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. That was a good thing. So, um, yeah, people just don't know about it. And you could see in the film what I said. I went there thinking I was just going to film a protest. And I lived with those people for three full weeks. And I kept hearing people say, you will not understand what we're doing and why we're doing this for seven years until you go to the April 3rd Peace Museum. They didn't tell me what happened. Mm. And I didn't know it, but many of the people you see in the film that I lived with, the older ones, were in their 70s and 80s, were children and young people who survived the massacre. Their parents, brothers and sisters, did not, I didn't know that. And so, when it was time for me to leave and go back to Seoul, the last two days, I went to the northern part of the island and the artist who created that beautiful, um, yeah. their kind of concrete images of the torturous deaths accompanied me. I'd become friends with him there. And uh, Father Patrick, the, the Columban priest that I became friends with, they took me there. And there was a movie and I watched the movie and it started talking about what happened after the war. It was just a real bird's eye view. And I went, oh, that's strange. And then I sat down in front of a computer and watched the film in English. And I saw some of these images and I learned about this horrible massacre at the hands of the United States military. I, I was not clear about that. If it was under the, the tutelage of the American, but by the <coughs> Korean army, or directly? Yeah, that's a good, good observation. Um, when the United States occupied Korea immediately after the war, we drove the Japanese out, then we became the occupying force. According to military policy, protocol, when the United States military occupies a country, if there's an army, they take it over. If there's not an army, we're it, and we're it anyway. Well, Korea did not have an army, because they had been under 35 years of Japanese occupation. What they had was a police force, and the police force had been run by all the leaders of it, and many of the police
Greece were Japanese. And they were hated by the Korean people. When the Americans came in, we kept the Japanese in power because we thought the Koreans don't know how to organize things. They're just peasants. They're ignorant. Well, that made the people even angrier. Just the opposite of what we did in Iraq. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but we got rid of the inexperience. Everything. And if you, the, the thing that confuses people is they mentioned the Korean constabulary. Yeah, yeah, right. I couldn't figure that out. That's a very British thing, no? Yeah, I don't know what it is. I've never heard of it. That's a word for it. Yeah. So when I, I came down here um, back in the early part of the year to interview Bruce Cummings, that was in the Meredith's quarters there, right in the middle of the UVA. Yeah, I'm talking. Yeah. It's right out of the lawn. Uh, yeah. Um, I, I, I asked Bruce Cummings, I, what is this constabulary? I, you, it's in your book and I've been reading this. And he goes, it's just another name for army. And the American generals, General Dean and General Hodge, didn't obey Washington, who didn't want us to create an army because Washington wanted us to occupy that place and had no intentions of allowing South Korea to become a sovereign nation. Okay. Well, the generals knew we, we could we can't stay here forever, and they created this constabulary, which is not really an army, but it is. Okay, and we recruited, we trained, we equipped. They didn't have any equipment. All the the, the stuff you saw was all American stuff. We trained them, we equipped them, and we commanded them directly. It's not able to be proven that the Americans actually shot the, the, the peasants during the April 3rd massacre. There is no proof yet of that, but it's an absolute certainty that we commanded directly the constabulary, the police forces, to commit those atrocities. Let me ask you a different question about that. They've set up this museum. Uh, just the way we have our stuff up on the mall in Washington, D.C. This is clearly a jewel in the crown of national memory in some way, right? Uh, they, they, they made a big deal. Is that for the islanders or is that shared in, in more widely in South Korea? That, that a, what happened here is something we must never forget. It, it took until 2003 for, them for, to apologize. for the Korean government to acknowledge what happened on Jeju. Prior to that, they have this national security law that started under Sigmund Rhee when they came up with this constitution, which we basically wrote for them, that forbade any opposition to the government and any mention whatsoever of what happened on Jeju and through the three successive dictatorships if people spoke about it or, or resisted, they were killed. And because they figured he's a leftist, communist sympathizer, his whole family must be, and the families would be persecuted as well. So people were terrified. It was a reign of terror. And they don't know how many thousands, maybe millions of people were killed by Sigmund Rhee and his successor, dictators, who who resisted. So what happened in 2005, um, Korea had been a democracy, a transition in 1985 or whatever it was, and it took until 2005 until the president of Korea acknowledged what happened and apologized on behalf of the Republic of Korea to the people of Jeju and their National Assembly named Jeju Island the island of peace. And there would never be war, never be bases. It was the island of peace. And they provided the money and commissioned the building of that museum as a memorial. Was this a political decision? That is, did they already know that eventually the Americans or somebody was going to want to come in there? So was this an attempt to preempt just the kind of thing that's now going on? I don't did know. Fail? But I, what I do know is, as far back as now, we've had a presence there ever since yeah. 1945. Um, and we had operations.
operational control of both the military and the police. And there was an uprising of students in Guangzhou, and I think it was 1985 or 1987. And it was massive. And to put it down, the United States troops and special forces came in and killed a lot of people. That created such blowback that at that time, the American government, American military, agreed to give control over internal things to Korean police and Korean military. So any future riots, the Americans would not handle what was inside, but we maintained operational control of what happened outside. Now, to get to where you're going with this, what I know and have heard is that um, we were building bases all over South Korea. And we weren't on Jeju, but the Korean government gave us permission, if we needed, to build a base, a naval base on Jeju, including an air base. And that air base yet hasn't even started, but it, word is getting out that the Americans already have permission to do that. So I don't know that this museum had anything to do with other political decisions, who knows. Uh, but it was a wonderful thing that finally happened that people could now talk about it. And they memorialized it there historically. Now, the other part of your question, that museum is on Jeju Island, directly north of Kangjang in Jeju City, just outside of Jeju City, which is the provincial capital. Most Koreans are not aware of that museum, and most Koreans are not aware of what happened on Jeju. I've had several Koreans nationals and Korean students who are here, Korean professors, in places like Boston College, MIT, Seattle, Minnesota, who themselves said, we only vaguely knew, it wasn't taught in the schools, but we only vaguely knew that there was an uprising on Jeju. That's it. I had several Korean people in the audience after the film give witness. And one woman had been in this country for a number of years, and she was an American citizen. She didn't speak English very well. She just blurted out and was crying, and she said, I never get involved in political things, but I heard about this, and I, I had to come see this film. And <clears throat> I have to tell you, first she said, thank you for making this film, for telling this story. And then she said, even now, I'm afraid to talk about this, because my family in the past has been persecuted, and even I today, living in the United States, I'm afraid that I could be targeted for speaking out against the government. But she wanted everybody to know this veil of silence had been placed upon the Korean people and it was still alive. I talked to younger people in their 40s and 50s who are Korean nationals, have been here for years, they're not American citizens, they're working in universities, who told me, we have to be very careful. And some of them even go under pseudonyms, different names, uh, when they get involved in activism and that kind of thing, so as not to endanger their families and <clears throat> not to be at risk themselves by the Korean intelligence agencies. I don't want to ask all the questions, but I want to make sure you know that David and I made repeated attempts to get a venue to show this at UVA by contacting Korean student groups, among others. I didn't get any answers. I, I didn't even get the courtesy of a response. I'm a professor at the university, yeah. and I wrote to these students and said, how about it? I'm, I was surprised that they didn't even write back and say, we're not interested in that, or as they might have said, we're, take, we're doing exams now, or, or something. They just didn't, there was no acknowledgement. I thought that was weird. I, I was taking this personally, because I contacted this group of uh, concerned uh, professors about what's happening in Korea, there's 20, 22 or 23, and I sent them an email and 
gave them a link to the website so they could see this, the description of it in the trailer. And um, only one contacted me. And she was a professor at the Peace University, the University of Peace in Costa Rica. She's Canadian, but Korean descent. And she bought two copies of the film and said, we're going to show this in our school. I, I'm not going to mention names because some of them are very well known uh, professors um, who have avoided me when I've been in their communities and in their schools. And at first I, I, I couldn't figure what it is. I think some of it might be with professors, academics. Um, here's this old white guy that went there and made this film. Who the hell is he? He, he's not an academic, he's not a historian, and they're not going to deal with this. This is a narrative, it's my personal discovery, my personal story. It's been vetted, it's accurate, there's nothing that's fictitious in this at all. It's just what it is. Um, the other part of it is with students, uh, especially Korean nationals in this tens of thousands of them in this country, they're everywhere. And it's Korean associations, Korean student associations in most of the major universities. I've been refused personally. I mean, they don't even answer you. So, I, it's a combination of things. I think part of it still is the fear to be involved in anything political, to be expelled from this country, to get in trouble when they go home, and worse yet, to embarrass their parents. Mm -hmm. I, I have a feeling that's what it is. I don't take it personally anymore. Um, Can I ask you a question about the police? You, you have footage in the film of the activists speaking to the police, saying some of you are from Jeju, which presumably is true, uh, but the, there are no indications of any of the police uh, switching sides or, or thinking of we, we we've seen this very recently in Thailand we've seen this in countries around the world uh, seen troops in Egypt we see uh, we see them switch sides but here the, the footage shows the police outnumbering the activists apparently uh, and uh, and what are the I mean is there any chance uh, of these law enforcement officers as we misname them uh, coming around. I don't know that, but I have had this conversation with people there in Jeju, some of the leaders, the activists. Um, I didn't see it there. In fact, it's just the opposite there. I tried to interview them. I'm I thought you about that. It would be interesting. You know, people said to me, you got to interview the police. Yeah. And I would go up and ask them, and, and there was always people, Koreans, with me, and they would translate just in case they might not have understood. A lot of the educated ones understand some English. And they would not even say no, they just look you straight ahead, would not talk to you. And I say, you know, after each of these actions, eight, ten times a day, there's two or three hundred police to remove now, there's two or three hundred police to remove maybe five or six people. Then there were 20, 25, but still two, three, four hundred police just, it, it's just incredible. And I wondered what went through their minds as they did this over and over. Some of them had to be sympathetic. You, you would think if they were citizens of Jeju or just who they are and how they were brought up or they think on their own, they're, but they have mandatory service in Korea. And it's two years as soon as you get out of high school, everybody. I'm not the one, I think, to try to even answer that question, except that I think in Korea, um, to honor your parents and not disappoint them is an enormous pressure on young people. The suicide rate of kids in Korea is extremely high, one of the highest in the world. And it's because of the pressure that's put on them to achieve in grades and school. It's, it's unlike anything we have here. And to displease or embarrass your parents. And I can't help but think that 
all of that cultural stuff has got a lot to do with why the police haven't crossed the line. Some of them haven't. There's, there's over 140,000 now that have been wrote. They don't keep them all there, the same ones. They rotate them. Probably that's why. I mean, it'd be horrible if you had to stay there six or seven years and do this every single day, ten times a day, sit on a bus all day long, and every time there's an action, you come marching out, and then you go to sleep in some barracks somewhere. That's a horrible life. So, yeah. There's still the thing I can't figure. There is some, somewhere in the system, uh, except as sheer ignorance keeps it from arising, there is a serious cognitive dissonance between, I mean, and in this century, between saying, we are not going to forget what happened on Jeju Island. This is the island of peace. We're going to spend money building this big thing. We're going to have this terrific art, commemorative art. This is an important part of our history that we're finally reclaiming and making our own. On the one hand. Yeah. And on the other hand, what your film delicately avoids, you know, by overlap, reinforcing as a, what is going to less a perfectly obvious sort of part two. Here's the sequel. Here's, here's police constabulary. We're not burning, we're not sh shooting people in ditches and, and incinerating their bodies. We're just breaking their, their, their feet. We're just fracturing yeah, their bones. But it's the same pattern, exactly. Yeah, yeah. How, why doesn't this, why doesn't this jam the machine someplace? Yeah. You see what I'm asking? What's interesting? You must have asked yourself that question. Yeah, the, 